and welcome to Bad Ideas, a show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and I have our bad idea for this week, which, before I start into the details of this, I have to preface with a little disclaimer. This week we're talking about art, and whenever you're judging art or saying something in art is a bad idea or a good idea, you're making a value claim? Like, I can't scientifically prove goodness or badness of any of these ideas, but it's an interesting story, and it has a few twists and turns that I found fascinating, and you'll have to judge for yourself ultimately whether the idea here was bad. But we are going to be talking about an artist named Mark Rothko. You ever heard of Mark Rothko, Tony? I have not heard of him. I'm just going to say I make value claims on art all the time. I'm really bad about it, especially because it's like I hate most abstract art. So I'm going to try to keep an open mind here. Okay. Well, this might be a good time to mention that at the, the moment that we're getting to in this story... Mark Rothko was indeed working as an abstract expressionist. Lots of big red and black squares in the particular work that we're going to be talking about. So that is not what we're saying is a bad idea. The fact that people enjoy giant red and black squares enough to pay lots of money for them, we are not making value judgments about that. But this story takes that and actually ratchets it up to another level of abstraction that we're going to get to. But before we go there, I want to talk a little bit about Mark Rothko himself, because he's an interesting guy. He's born in Russia, and he immigrates from Russia to the United States at the age of 10 in 1913. His father was pulling the family away from the war that he saw coming there and the potential of being his sons being conscripted into the Russian army And immediately after getting to the United States, his dad dies. So they've just arrived in America. Mark Rothko, at the time, he is Marcus Rothkowitz. He is dealing with a lot of problems just on being uprooted, on the death of his father. And he gets to this country and things are not all great and wonderful and rosy because he grows up as an immigrant as a Jew in a time when it was still cool to be mean to people because they were Jewish. And he has a really, really rough childhood. And in 1923, he moves to New York partly because he's interested in this world of art. And he sees that there is art, artistic stuff happening in New York. He wants to be a part of it. And he goes there and signs up for art school and the style of the time was already becoming more abstract we think of sort of older paintings as being like of real things right but even in the early 1900s they were already getting into cubism and different types of abstraction and art was getting weird even back then and so that's the kind of tradition that he grows up in he he's taught these different types of techniques and these different philosophies of art as something that is going to speak to the soul that it's not just a picture of something but it's supposed to connect with you on a spiritual level and he just works at being an artist there's there's not uh, this is not a biography of mark rothko so we're going to skip over a lot but long story short mark rothko makes a name for himself Mark Rothko gets popular enough so that he starts getting commissions for his art. People start buying it. They start becoming more interested in his art and they start commissioning art. And one of the big name commissioners of Mark Rothko's art was Harvard University. Harvard comes to Mark Rothko and they say to him, we've got this new building. It's called the Holyoke Center. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's spelled H-O-L-Y-O-K-E. I believe you're right. And this building is an administrative building. It's a big H-shaped structure. And at the top of this building is a penthouse. Now, apparently this is a thing that is relatively common. You'll have a building that's not necessarily apartments, but then at the top you'll just have a living area. 
Yeah, you had that. You had a weird discussion in chat earlier today or earlier this week, where you were really surprised that that's a thing, and that's just pretty common. Like the the top one is usually like a luxury condo or like some living spaces or things like that. Like in a lot of different buildings, not all buildings, but like even the uh, Pepsi Center in Denver has a giant penthouse at the top of it. And so there's this big, you know, penthouse at the top of this administrative building and Harvard approaches Rothko and they say to him, we are interested in you painting some pieces of art for this new center that we have. And we're going to put them in the dining room of this penthouse. And Mark Rothko gets to work on this and he paints these paintings that are, as I described earlier, very abstract Imagine a red square with two black boxes and calling it art. <sighs> there, there's, there's several of them. It's not just the one, okay? But yes, there are black boxes and red boxes and red black boxes inside of red boxes. And there's one that's kind of cool that has like not just boxes, but also like blue blurs of things that looks a little better. I, I think... That something that is lost, especially in Mark Rothko's work, when you're talking about it, we are looking at pictures of this work on the internet, Tony. Yeah, thumbnails, no less. <laughs> From everything that I was able to read, Rothko wasn't just about the color, but also about the texture of the painting and how it caught the light in various ways. And this is going to play into what ultimately becomes what we are calling the bad idea of this episode because he doesn't treat his canvas he uses some weird materials in his paints he was known to use whole eggs and when the hmm. painting is done he doesn't varnish it right like a, a lot of older paintings you'll see there will be kind of a, a sheen over it and that's because they've put something over the painting to sort of seal in the freshness as it were <laughs> where Mark Rothko was not about that. He didn't want that shiny th stuff on there. He wanted this rough ragged kind of look and he worked very hard to achieve that in addition to the colors that he was using. And he brings his paintings to the Holyoke center to put them up. And when he gets there, he kind of has a freak out because when he gets to the Holyoke Center, the place that they have his paintings set up is directly opposite these giant windows. So in addition to him being just in somebody's dining room somewhere, I mean, granted, a real nice dining room, but it's not like he's in a museum, right? They've just shoved him sort of like in there with the food that people are going to eat and there's not going to be somebody telling people, Hey, don't touch the art, watch out, you know, Oh, you've bumped it with your chair and ripped it. That's not cool. In addition to all of that, there's going to be all of this sunlight coming in through these windows. And if you don't know, paint and pigment can be damaged by ultraviolet light. It gets dulled whenever it's in the sun. And probably most people have experienced this. If you have like a toy that your kid had, and you leave it outside for a while, it's not going to retain its bright color. It's going to get dull and sort of lose that luster that it had initially. And for someone like Rothko, who would have been very, very concerned with the vibrancy of these colors, this is a problem. So Rothko says, guys, 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 this is not, this is not going to fly. We got to put some blinds in, right? Which seems like, okay, good idea but we'll block the light for most of the time, except for the fact that like people don't like to be in a room with closed blinds. I don't know what kind of weird people you're talking about. Like I don't allow light in my house. Okay. Well, a lot of people, especially if you're in a high end penthouse overlooking one of the most beautiful college campuses in the world, you might want to see that. Yeah. Overrated. <laughs> okay. I can't have well, my skin being turned dark by this light. Tony's personal tastes aside, these blinds did not get used very much. At least not as much as somebody like Rothko would have liked. Now, this would have been a problem already, but there's something that makes it worse. And the foundational bad idea here is that Rothko used a specific kind of pigment 
in his painting. And this pigment is called Lithol Red. Lithol Red has a problem. It is what is called a fugitive pigment. And what that means is, it's not that it runs away off the canvas or whatever, but that in these conditions of direct UV light, it does not hold its color very well. On top of that, modern analysis of the paintings has determined that the binder that Rothko used for this pigment, the stuff that sort of holds it all together after the paint dries. Like a binding agent, not like a binder for paper. Correct, yes. The, the binder that he used actually accelerated this quality of Lithol Red. And so almost immediately, these paintings start losing their luster. And on, in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, this is a dining room for a college. Like, not it's not the cafeteria or something, but it is, you know, late teen, early 20-something people who are renting this room out for sort of high-class functions, and they're not being careful about the paintings. Some of them are maybe going to accidentally bump into them and rip them a little bit. Some of them are going to write on the paintings to try to immortalize themselves to the world. And while all of this is happening, the paintings keep fading and keep fading. Now, as the fading is happening, Mark Rothko dies. He commits suicide. His wife left him. He was in his late 60s. He sort of exits the scene here and... The college doesn't know exactly what to do. Like, they weren't able to tell exactly who was in charge of these paintings. The people who were running the Holyoke Center weren't art people. They just ran the building, right? They were sort of low-level, administrative, boring types. And the art people who would have been able to do something about this didn't really necessarily have the authority or weren't contacted to do anything about it. So these paintings stay up until 1979 and they're fading and they're fading and they're fading and they're essentially just turning brown, right? What was this like brilliant splash of red color sort of meant to speak to man's soul has now been degraded to the point where it's just like puke colored. I'm I'm just imagining like him like you've you've got an artist who's worth probably went up after he killed himself and just letting these paintings degrade. Uh, it went up before he killed himself. He had several years of it being up before that happened, but they eventually have to take this art down and they store it in the dark where nobody can see it, trying to preserve whatever can be left of this art, and. This is the part of the story where I'm going to get a little conspiracy theory, Tony. I've read quite a bit about Mark Rothko and his philosophy and how he approached his art. And I don't think this was an accident. I, I don't know if we have an episode where it's just blinds are the bad idea, like just closing the blinds. Like I was trying to figure out what's going on here. Like what's uh, what's this conspiracy? What's what's going on that makes this a compelling thing? If you buy the this was just ignorance on Rothko's part, the bad idea here is that he used Lithol Red and that he d didn't seal his paints and he sort of had this kind of weird affectation where he you know, wanted this kind of raw feeling to his paintings and that he just sort of threw caution to the wind and said, who cares about, you know, these other practices? I know better. I'm Mark Rothko and you put your things up and better put some blinds up because that's going to ruin them otherwise. But I don't think this was done in ignorance. I have a theory and it is only a theory that Mark Rothko really didn't like this commission. And I have prior evidence for this. There was one other large commission that Mark Rothko had been given before the Harvard one. He had been commissioned to put some artwork in the new Four Seasons restaurant. And he had designed a lot of these paintings, and I believe actually completed some of them. But his feeling about how this 
art was being used was just completely disdainful. Even for just the like the regular commissions that he did or people who just bought his work as he began to get more popular he really got uncomfortable that people were just buying his work because he was popular and they didn't actually appreciate it so you can understand how somebody who's this much about the pure art would really have some reservations about a business buying his soul touching work and throwing it up in their either restaurant or dining room i'm reminded of a scene from unbreakable where he won't sell that like perfect piece of art for a kid's bedroom <laughs> i i'd forgotten that scene but yes they the interesting thing was rothko initially had planned to go through with the four seasons artwork but he said and i'm quoting here told a friend of his in private he wanted to make the restaurant's patrons, quote, feel they are trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up so that all they can do is butt their heads forever against the wall, unquote. I mean, that's kind of what I feel whenever I see this picture is like, why? <laughs> I, I think in his mind, it was going to be a little bit more just like basic, like soul sucking, just you hate to be in the same room with these paintings that that was his plan for everybody, not just for people who hate Impressionist art. But this is one piece of evidence that I have. The other piece of evidence that I have is that Lithol Red was well known at the time to be impermanent in its pigment. Uh, and I have this evidence from the Artist's Handbook of Materials and Techniques from 1951, which is... 10 years before Mark Rothko would have been working on this artwork. And I quote now from that book, when first made, it was much recommended because it was an advance in permanence over the older aniline lakes. Don't know why they called them lakes, but I think they're talking about the pigments, but it is not sufficiently light proof to be used for permanent painting. And if that isn't enough, I do have one more piece of evidence that I think goes into this theory because I haven't mentioned a lot about the Holyoke Center yet, but it's notable because it's a drastic departure from the architecture of Harvard. It's this brutalist building is the, like the actual architecture word to describe how this thing was built. Everything else in Harvard is this sort of quaint colonial kind of 1700 style inspired architecture and then right in the middle of the campus is this giant ugly angular building that also immediately started falling apart there's probably a whole separate bad ideas episode about the Holyoke building itself if we really want to get into it and so for Mark Rothko the artist who is all about the art to be asked to put his painting in the ugliest building on the campus in a dining room in that building in my mind he comes up with a plan for revenge. He says, yeah, fine. I'll make your painting and it'll be awesome for about a year. So he took that money and ran to the grave. <laughs> yes. There is, however, another twist in this story. Because, as, as I mentioned, they took down the paintings and they had them in storage. And because of how Rothko had done these paintings, there wasn't really a way to restore them. Like you could just paint the whole thing over again, but it wouldn't still be the original painting. You would have ha repainted so much that it would basically not matter. So they left them in storage for a long time until 2014 when they found a way to restore Mark Rothko's paintings. And here's how they did it. They projected over the paintings the original colors as they would have appeared with a corrective digital projector. That's pretty interesting. It, it's fascinating to me. They literally went back. It's not just like they shined some red light on it. They literally went back and pixel by pixel adjusted the luminance of this projector to match what you would have seen if you had been looking at Rothko's paintings when they were first painted. And 
the really interesting thing to me was that one of the things that you could do during the time that these paintings were being displayed was you could watch them turn the paintings off. You could see what they would have looked like in their original glory under the projector. And then they would turn the projector off and you would experience the painting as it is today, all brown and muddy and sort of ugly. And I, I read several articles that talked about this experience and it was fascinating because it's really a window into the question of what art even is. Because if you can project the art onto the art, but that's not the art, like where, where exactly does the art live, Tony? It, it's like Mark Rothko inadvertently created a whole new type of artwork. With his bad art. Oh well, whenever I was looking at his, I was looking at his wiki, wiki, and like some of the things that he was that influenced him seemed like that would actually be a good idea for like the impermanence of things. There's no way he could have so, planned that part. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I'm just saying I think that he would actually approve of that. I think that I think that th as you mentioned, the impermanence and the sort of questioning of where does that feeling come from when you look at art and you have some kind of reaction. If you do have some kind of reaction, Tony doesn't believe in that for this kind of art, but the fact that you have the artist's original work and then you have some restorer's work literally projected over it, but working in tandem really brings up just a whole slew of interesting questions about art. And I think it is in itself like a new type of way of thinking about art. I don't know for a fact that Mark Rothko intended for these paintings to fade. It's a fun idea. And if it is, this is not really eligible for a bad ideas episode, but I got into this and thinking about what kind of person he was, it really seemed to fit for me. So I'm, I'm throwing it out there for you guys. You can judge one way or another if you think that that's very likely, but it seemed like a fun kind of little twist on the story of a guy who uh, maybe didn't want his work displayed in a place that was you know, for idiot 20 year olds to eat their dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and this has been the first edition of the abstract bad ideas podcast yes! where the ideas might not be bad, but they could be bad. <laughs> they, you have to think of it for yourself. Is the idea bad? <laughs> it's only bad if it's bad to you, Tony. Yep. That is going to do it for this week, though. Thank you so much for listening. If you have bad ideas that you would like us to cover, uh, please send them in to badideasshow at gmail.com, or you can hit us up on Twitter at Human Echoes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, drop a comment. We would love to read and explore all of those options. Also, if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe, and... Over on Patreon.com at Patreon.com slash Human Echoes, you can help support the show and help us make more of it. I think that's going to do it for this week, so we will see you next week with more bad ideas. Take care, y'all.